All right, good morning. I can see we good a, good evening. Those of you on Facebook, you just didn't get the full ramification of the reaction on that statement. But uh, anyway, good evening and welcome to Lights Out. <laughs> All the old timers know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, all right, and great to have you here. Those of you that are not at home watching football, um, we're more interested in the Lord's Word, and so we do like every good Baptist does, and we DVR the football game, and we can watch it when we go home and fast forward through all the ridiculousness and and uh, see uh, Tom Brady, the GOAT, win another Super Bowl. And uh, so I don't know if you're into that or not, but I really, I'm really not. He's old, and I'm so I'm rooting for the old guy, right? Um, but anyway, uh, great to have you here. Looking forward to studying in the Word of God tonight, Genesis. I think we're in Chapter 8, right, Ty? 7. 7. He's move I'm going to call him the Flash. He's moving so quick. And uh, so anyway, we'll enjoy that tonight. Let's stand together. Our TV's not switched over, Tyler, so uh, that would help in the singing um, tonight. And we're going to sing Love Lifted Me 413. We're going to sing all the verses, so let's stand together. And uh, remember to do your uh, Bible calisthenics when you do it. Come on, Miss Diane, you can do it. Yes, you can. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help. people at home uh, you're in your living room you're in your fat pants I know you are you didn't get dressed for church so uh, let's use those stretchy pants well and do those calf raises and uh, let's get lifted up for the Lord Jesus Christ amen second verse here we go all my heart to him I give ever to him I cling in his blessed presence live ever his praise is slide all right here we go this world is not my home thank the lord we're just passing through uh, page number 485 we'll sing first second and fourth verse this world is not my home Not my home, oh Lord, what will I 
that's good singing you may be seated and just a few things that we need to make uh, announcements on uh, our uh, couples uh, small group bible study monday nights at 6 30 we're going to be starting our financial study uh, this week or next and so uh, you might want to take advantage of that um, uh, that's on monday nights at 6 30 at our home uh, and then also the teen lock-in is uh, this uh Friday, is it time? This Friday at uh, 8 p.m. here at the church, and they're going to be enjoying uh, just some crazy uh, all-night stuff. I remember when I was young and I had the energy to do that, and I'm so glad somebody else is doing it now, and I can relax and sleep when it's supposed to be sleeping time, amen? Uh, and But they'll enjoy a, a good time there. Uh, also, our Children's Church Valentine celebration, uh, a lot of uh, activity going on there. They'll be singing and um uh, reciting scripture they'll be doing that in front of the church uh, uh, for the start of it and then once they go back there they're going to be doing some things uh, by way of uh, old pie making and pie chucking and uh, stuff of that nature prizes and such and so that's going to be good um, and so uh, if you know somebody that might like to be a part of that maybe you've got some friends or neighbors um, and you could invite them to that that would be an awesome uh, thing to do. We did get some whipped cream uh, donated, and so it's in the refrigerator. Um, we're going to make that nice and cold, maybe get some dry ice and pack it and uh, make sure that it's real proper and, and everything. But uh, looking forward to that and appreciate uh, all those participating. Uh, and then also uh, Prime Timers uh, meeting on March the 6th as well uh, here at the church at 11 o'clock. And uh, then we have uh, sign-up sheets for Focus night and several other sign-up sheets. The focus nights are going to start in March, March the 7th to be exact. And we'll do these once a month. It, it won't be every Sunday night, but the idea is to just take a minute out of uh, our schedule of church services and then come together and have a time of prayer, a little uh, challenge from the Word of God, and to be able to talk about what the Lord is doing in our life to interact with uh, lost people and how... Uh, we're making progress on that, some of the relationships that we're starting. Uh, you might could pray for me, I might could pray for you, uh, and uh, just talk about maybe some things that would help each one of us engage in the work of the Lord. And so that's, uh, that's of great necessity, and I think that'll perpetuate our church in a great direction and get us doing the work of the Lord, as opposed to just thinking the work of the Lord is showing up to church having a good Bible message and having that be an encouragement to us, God means for that to compel us to motivation and service for him. And so uh, I want you to really be um, planning to do that. Uh, several that are watching tonight uh, on Facebook, you may not be regularly attending our Sunday evening services, and I'm only asking for one a month. And so uh, if you don't normally attend, please be here it'll be a, a thing that will grow you spiritually and um, it'll be a help to you so i want you to sign up for that so that we know how to uh, break up into our groups yes ma'am on the seventh i believe it is yes what i can't hear you th yes all right that is anniversary sunday but we are not doing a uh, meal on that uh, day so uh, oh, sorry, uh, people can't hear that on Facebook, but uh, it was just a question. And so uh, March of the 7th uh, will be our focus night on Sunday evening. I think that's all the announcements that we have. Our giving announcement is the same. You can give uh, on the back wall. Uh, we have our offering boxes, and then you can also give online as well. And um, uh, just uh, be faithful to do that. I do want to remind you of a couple different things. 
uh, be faithful to your uh, faith promise giving and uh, just keep that a priority through your life this year and that'll be uh, something that God will bless uh, in your life for. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, be mindful to pray for your missionaries. You know, we've been doing that rotating every week and I just want to keep that on your heart and mind. You've got that list. Go, go down through there. Uh, don't get caught up in the routine. Be sure you're accessing that and praying for these missionaries each and every day, every week, and uh, they are, they're in great need. And so uh, we can lift that burden for them. All right, Ty, come ahead and preach to us. Everybody hear me? Okay. Genesis chapter number 7. And I know we are moving so quickly through, as Dad so aptly pointed out. But as the teens know, I, I take my time going through. Uh, I think we'll be uh, this week in Genesis 7, and probably next week we'll finish it up, uh, and then we'll get into... Genesis chapter number 8, uh, and again, we're dealing with different aspects of the flood. Some of these, uh, I've mentioned them in past, but we'll hit them a little more in detail uh, at certain points. It's going to be a lot of uh, today's, in fact. Uh, it's something that we've mentioned before, but we're going to get a little more uh, into it in this passage of Scripture, and the reason we're doing that is because uh, there are things that God repeats through these chapters. And he brings them up again, and so we're just taking it as God has written it. We're taking verse, uh, verse by verse at a time. So tonight we're going to be going through ch uh, verse number 10 through 24, uh, and we might not make it all the way down to verse number 24, but that's the whole section where we're at. So we're going to go ahead and read that, Genesis chapter number 7, verses 10 through 24. Uh, and it starts, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wives, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They, and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth, and the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And you can kind of get from the reading of this that there was a lot of water. Uh, he's saying that it's prevailing, it's exceedingly great. Sounds like a, uh, a partial flood, right? Uh, that's what everyone says. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle, and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So we see here uh, that God is really describing this flood with some detail. Uh, he is, by his own words, uh, denouncing the theories that are prevailing now that, oh, well, it wasn't, a whole, it wasn't a whole earth flood, it was a partial flood, and 
that terminology that God used, the whole earth, it could be the, the known earth at the time, but that's not the terminology that God uses, right? Several times within that passage, verses 10 through 24, God mentions that the water prevailed over the face of the earth and over every, uh, all the hills and the high hills and the mountains, they were covered, right? So this is something that God's being very specific with. Uh, and so we're going to take these verses and we'll cover as much as we can. So right now we're talking about God's judgment of sin. And we're going to start with something pretty interesting. I mentioned this last week, but we're going to get into why this is so interesting this week. So the date of this disaster, looking in verses number 11 and 12, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And I mentioned this last week that this event is the most precisely dated event in the entire word of God. The, and out of everything that is mentioned, this particular event has the most precise date in all of scripture, which to me, when you find that out, kind of blows my mind because you would think that uh, the most precisely dated uh, event would be the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, the birth of Jesus Christ separates what we know as dates in general. You have B.C. and A.D., before Christ and the year of our Lord. All of that's based around Jesus Christ's birth and his life that he lived. Uh, and yet, when we see, and I'm going to get to this in a little bit, the wise men were two years late. And these were men that studied scripture and that studied prophecy, and they were two years late in when Jesus Christ actually came on the earth. But God is so very precise in the date of this disaster. And so uh, using Usher's math, Usher is a, uh, a biblical scholar, and uh, the flood occurred 1,656 years after Adam, after Adam died, or for the precise date, that would be 2,349 B.C. is when the flood of the earth uh, was, was uh, prevalent and was happened. Uh, and how do, so how do we get this date? How do we know? Obviously, we know uh, from the passage that we just read that um, in verse number 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, uh, in the 17th day of the month, and so... Uh, God's actually giving a date in time, but God gave us chapter 5 so that we could help see the event of Noah. So when we were going through the genealogies in chapter 5, we ran into a man whose name was Methuselah. And what is known about Methuselah? There's two significant things about him. First is he's the oldest man to ever live. 969 years Methuselah lived on this earth. And the second thing is the meaning of his name. The meaning of his name is when he is dead, it shall be sent, or it shall come, that it being referred to as judgment. Right? This was Enoch's son. Enoch is someone that walked with God, had a relationship with God, and had knowledge of the things that were to come. We saw that when we talked about Enoch. I'm not going to go and rehash that. But in his knowledge, he names his son uh, Methuselah, knowing that there was a judgment that was going to come on this earth. And so looking at the Genesis chapter 5, uh, we're going to look at some of these years. Methuselah begat Lamech at 187 years old, according to Genesis 5.25. Methuselah lived a, 185 and 7 years and begat Lamech. Lamech begat Noah at 182. In Genesis 5, 28, and Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son. And the flood came when Noah was 600 years uh, on the earth, according to Genesis 7, 11, which is the verse that we just read. I'm not going to go back and read it again. We've read it a few times. And Methuselah died at 969 years. Uh, Genesis 5, 27, all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. And so God has the judgment. Uh, this particular judgment is dated for them. Now, what's interesting, and where we're going to go with this right now, is Noah and the rest of humanity at that time didn't know how long Methuselah was going to live. You can uh, assume to yourself that according to Genesis chapter 6, that at least Noah knew that there were going to be 120 years 
until the judgment came. God said, and the years of man will be 120 years. Uh, but even in Genesis chapter 6, there's no specific mentioning that uh, God said that to Noah specifically. That was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. I'll read that verse for you. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Uh, there's nothing that said he said this to Noah specifically. This could have been much like in the creation when God said, Let us create man in our image after our likeness. God could have been talking within his person and within the parts of the Trinity. And so mankind, at least in prevalent, did not know when this judgment was coming, that there was something coming. But in God's math and in God's time, everything was precisely dated. God knew when Methuselah would die. God knew exactly what time he would put. And so God had this specifically dated. Well, Pastor Tyler, why is this significant? God has the judgment of the second coming dated in the Bible also. But much like Noah and the generation that he lived in, we're not quite able to figure it out precisely. There's not, we don't know the exact day, the exact time, or the exact hour that God will come. In fact, God tells us as much. No man knows the day or the hour that Christ would come, but he has given us enough, just as he had given Noah enough, to know that it's coming soon. He told Noah, build an ark, because it's coming soon. And at the very end, he gave him seven days, because he said, in seven days, judgment is coming. So Noah, get on the ark. And so now I see ourselves, the more I study the flood, the more connections you see with the time that we are in now, he's spent time in the Word of God saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the coming of the Son of Man. God did not just include Noah and the ark so that it could be a famous children's story that we would tell kids. This is in the book of Genesis because God is giving us a revelation about what is going to happen in future times. It's not going to happen exactly like this because we know that the next one is going to be uh, with fire and not with water. But God is still going to judge this earth because of wickedness. And there are going to be things that pop up. And we've talked about the, the timeline that God has given. The day is as a thousand years and the thousand years is as a day uh, with God. And in the book, uh, I believe that's 1 Peter where that's mentioned, that verse is mentioned right after God is talking about the flood. So the timeline that God is using is he's using the same pattern. And I believe that when God comes back, we're going to be able to look back and say the second coming was one of the most precisely dated moments in God's mind and in God's history. The day that when judgment would fall. He has given us more than enough information within his word for us to be knowledgeable and to be aware and to be working quickly because of the judgment that's coming. And I thought that was uh, profound. Uh, Amber, I'm going to skip down a few, verse, uh, a few slides uh, to 159. Uh, from the 17th day of the second month to the seventh day of the seventh month is precisely 150 days. And this reveals uh, that God is using a lunar calendar of 12 months of 30 days. And so God is trying to make this as specific as possible for us to understand the timeline that he's using and what he is trying to accomplish on this earth. And so that is the, uh, the calendar of which we would use for understanding the rest of the Word of God and where how God works. So I thought that was very interesting, uh, the dating and why God decided to put in a date. In fact, this is the very first time that God dates something. There's a specific, not just how many years it was, but God makes sure to tell us which year of his life it was, which month it was, and which day of the month it was, when it began to rain. And anytime you see a first in Scripture, that's something that you should take knowledge of. So the ark had many firsts, the very first building project of God, and the most precisely dated thing that God ever said in the Word of God. Amazing what God draws out, and it's something that we should take notice of for his second coming. Now, moving on, another question that many people have with the flood and uh, with how it could be a worldwide flood. Because most people would say that they believe in a flood. Right? You can 
look across the world and see remnants of a flood in certain places. And so most people would agree with us in saying that there was a flood on the earth at one time, but it wasn't a worldwide flood. And one of the questions that uh, they would ask is, where did all the water come from? Where did all the water come from? Now, I think this is also pretty interesting, and it's actually kind of changed uh, my mindset, and uh, well, let's just get into it. And so the Bible says that the fountains of the great deep, the fountains of the great deep. Now, what's interesting about that, if I was to ask most people what they think the fountains of the great deep would be, you would probably say it's water from under the earth that has come up to the surface. That's probably what most of us would think. Deep oceans uh, would come through. The problem is that all throughout Scripture, the great deep is never in reference to a place that is actually on the earth. This word, the same deep that we saw in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 2, is the same, uh, or in this passage, is mentioned in Genesis 1 uh, verse number 2. If you want to go back, oh, I'm losing stuff up here. If you want to go back and look at that, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it's not on your slide. Um, uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is before the earth even had a physical form, and before God had separated the heavens from the earth with a firmament. Uh, if you continued to read, uh, in the verse number 6 of chapter 1, God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So in this time, before earth actually had physical form, what we can understand is that there is quite a bit of water in the universe. And God refers to it as the deep. It's also found in Job chapter number 38, verse 30, and in Revelation chapter number 4, verse 6, out of the second heaven. And so in the vast expanse of space, there was water that God used. And uh, Job 38, 29 through 30 is a verse that we have. Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven who hath gendered it, the waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen." And so here, God is giving us insight onto where the water came from that was upon the face of the uh, earth. It said that it came from the great deep, and it also came from the windows of heaven. All right, I do not believe these to be two different things. I believe God is trying to show us where exactly it came from. I remember when we were at the Creation Museum. How many of you have ever been to the Creation Museum? All right, this was before their Ark Encounter. Uh, so I'll go ahead and say this. Things might have changed since the time we did it. I remember watching a little video that they had in their ark section at the time of what they believe the flood might have looked like. And the very first thing that they, set, they showed was water coming up out of the ground and covering the earth and then starting to rain. I do not believe that is what happened. I believe the, from the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven are the same thing. God's saying this is not something that was earthbound and came from this earth. It was a supernatural event that God allowed waters from outside earth's atmosphere and earth's uh, sphere of influence, and God brought the waters from the heavens that he had created and brought it to the earth. Uh, and so the windows of heaven, we see that mentioned throughout scripture. First in Isaiah 24, uh, 18, says, And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Job chapter 22, 14. Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. And so uh, we see that God occasionally, on certain moments, he opens up heaven and brings a supernatural influence onto the earth. And this flood was one such event. One of the reasons people doubt the uh, worldwide flood is because at this moment, right, all the water that's on the earth, we have enough dry land that it's not covered. And people would say, well, there's not enough water for it to have covered the earth because this is not a normal natural disaster. 
This is a supernatural event that God brought into being. Uh, which is another reason why I believe, and this is kind of a side rabbit trail, uh, I've had conversations with certain people. A lot of people believe that in Revelation, when second judgments come, people are going to be, ex be able to explain away some of these judgments as natural disasters that are occurring. I do not, because the second coming, the second judgment, much like the first with Noah, is going to be something that is absolutely, without question, an act of God. And not in man's sense, but in there's no way that this could have naturally happened. This is the destruction from God from on high on this planet. And so that's a little side thing for you. But again, connecting the next judgment with this first one. Uh, and so there is no way that water is going to cover 15 cubits above the highest mountain on earth without some supernatural intervention. And now before we get carried away, we don't know that at this time Mount Everest would have been the highest point. Uh, we do know that at some point after the flood and the days of Peleg, that the earth is divided. I believe that up until this point, there was a one continent uh, land piece, uh, what scientists would call Pangaea. And I believe that after the flood, those lands started to divide into what we have uh, now. Again, that's not uh, biblical, the only thing the Bible says is that in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Uh, that, so that's some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some, some guessing? Is the word, what is it? Speculation, thank you. I couldn't think of it. Guessing is a really bad word to say. Uh, but, so, uh, whatever the highest mountain at the time was, we know that the water covered the highest point of earth by 15 cubits. And now, is, is Lance here? Lance. Lance and I were talking the other day. We, I was calling him on the phone, and he was telling me uh, he's been doing some research on his own about some of this flood stuff. And we thought that it was interesting that God sp specifically says that the water covered the mountains by 15 cubits. Right? God could have just said that it covered the mountains, but he didn't. And so Lance was uh, telling me, and uh, let me make sure that I get this right. The reason it was 15 cubits is uh, when you take the dimensions of the ark that God specifically told Noah to build and all the animals that would have been on, all the weight that would have been on the ark, uh, the draft, is that what you called it? The draft of how, how low the ark would have sunk into the water would have been about 15 cubits. And so God made sure that that water rose above the highest point of the earth just enough so that the ark and its dimensions and everything that was on it would be safe from any obstruction from the earth. Now, that's just coincidence, right? There's no way that that could have been planned. God just got lucky on that one. And I, I thought that was amazing that, right, God didn't just put in 15 cubits to show, hey, I brought a lot of water down. There was a reason for it, and that's something that we can uh, begin to understand. And so this was definitely a supernatural intervention from God on his behalf. So the time of the rain is given as 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, we've talked about that as uh, the number of testing uh, that Noah had to go through. 40 days and 40 nights it rained, and God brought this miraculous supernatural destruction upon the face of the earth. Now, uh, we've talked about some of this before, but teaching the types in the flood, there have been many types, apologies, that we've seen from the materials that were used to the dimensions that God gave to uh, the people that were on the ark and to the people that were around. A lot of different pictures that God was bringing in. And we're going to talk about one specifically today, uh, starting in Genesis 7, 13 through 16. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. And here's the key verse that we're going to, the key phrase that we're going to focus on. And the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. When we were going through the types of the dimensions of the ark, we learned that there was one door on the ark. 
One door that was made, when God told Noah to make it, the ark was made with the door open. And when the time was right, the Bible says in Genesis 7, 16, that the Lord shut the door of the ark. Now, this is interesting because we understand that the ark has a door, according to Genesis 6, 16. I'm not going to take it, uh, but understanding that the, the picture of that door is salvation by one way. Only one way into the ark. Only one way out of the ark. This is a picture of grace. The fact that the Lord shut the door, man himself cannot save him. The Lord is the one that shut the door to offer security. All right. So the picture here is not just salvation. The picture is security. Noah himself was able to enter into the ark because of the choice that he made. God did not force Noah into the ark. Noah chose to go in. That is salvation. What this is a picture of is the eternal security of God. Once Noah entered into the ark, God shut the door so that no one could go in and Noah himself could not go out. Well, why would Noah want to go out? Well, because Noah was a human being and when things started to happen, it would have been very natural for Noah to want to save somebody else and bring more people onto the ark. But Noah had no control over when that door shut. God did. And he's going to picture this throughout Scripture in verses like, uh, no man is able to pluck them out of, my, out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Understanding that when God does something, man cannot change it. Man cannot influence it. Noah had at this moment become the special object of divine care and protection, and that to those without, the season of grace was over. Remember, we talked about the seven days of grace that God gave. God told Noah, it's time, come into the ark, thou and all thine house, and all the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and the creeping things, everything, get it onto the ark, because in seven days it's coming. Right? So God gave a season of grace, a season of time, which just happened to be seven days. Right? And this world that we live in, he is given a season of grace for before his final judgment. He's given us time to bring as much as we can onto the ark. But when that door closes, that season of grace is over. Matthew chapter 25, verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. This is actually in reference to millennial kingdom, not rapture of the church, but uh, the picture is the same. God, for the Jewish people in the time of tribulation and in the time of the millennial kingdom, uh, there's going to be a time where they can no longer accept. There's going to be witnesses through the tribulation that are able to uh, be God's witnesses, the true Jehovah's Witness uh, here on the earth. Uh, but there's going to be a time when that door will shut on God's authority. In fact, he uses the same phraseology, the door was shut. Only one door, God shuts it, and there's perfect security. Not one person or animal was lost to the flood if they were inside the ark, according to Genesis 7.23. Every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping thing and fowls of the heaven, they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Perfect security inside Jesus Christ. What a picture of our salvation that when we are in Christ, when we are in the ark, we have perfect security with him. You're not able to lose your salvation, according to uh, some people that as Pastor mentioned this morning, wrongly divide the word of truth. When God speaks of salvation and when he speaks of uh, being one with him, it is nothing but evident that God is eternal and he wants this to be perfectly secure. And we are perfectly secure in him. So this is a type of the door of heaven that is mentioned. Heaven not only has windows, we talked about the windows of heaven opening and uh, God influencing this world, and, but there's a door for us to get into heaven. 
the window is God's way of interacting with the earth in a supernatural way. The door is how we will interact with in, in heaven, with him. And so the door, uh, heaven has not only windows, but a door. Uh, this door opens twice in the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, verse number 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Second time in Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And so God opens this door of heaven so that people are able to glimpse inside and what is happening. And so kind of giving us an idea of what heaven is like. It has a window for God to interact with man. It has a door for us to see and us to enter in. And in Revelation chapter number 3, verse 7, this should start to sound very familiar to those of us that have been here the last few Sunday mornings. When the Lord shuts the door, that's it. Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. All right, so God once again is presenting a door to mankind that he opens and he shuts. In Revelation 3, verse 20, God is on the outside of that door. Man can open the door by hearing the voice of God and opening the book. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This was the secret of the Philadelphian church, or as the Bible refers to it, the church of the open door. Revelation 3, 7 and 8. I've already read verse 7, but you can read verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And so this idea of the door that God has given, God always presents one door. There's one way that God wants things done. There's not multiple ways into heaven. There was not multiple ways into the ark. And in Philadelphian church age, there was not multiple ways to give the word of God. In fact, as soon as we learned this morning, as soon as people started changing the word of God and started creating more doors, in a sense, God shut that door. Because in God's mind, there is always one door, and that is God's way. God's plan. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. Not a way, a truth, or a life, but the, only one. And God is in control of when that door will shut. This same truth is true for the tribulation period. I talked about this a little in Matthew chapter 25, 1 through 10. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, which millennial kingdom as we're talking about, be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut." All right, so looking at this story, another instance of a door being shut, but this is not specifically for the church now, uh, although there is a door, that door is Jesus Christ, and as we know, and we've taught that before, there's a time when God will shut that door. Now he's opened a door for the tribulation period. The virgins are the tribulation Jews. Although God will again deal directly with Israel, not all Jews will be saved. All right, so God splits this up, five wise uh, Jewish, five foolish ones. 
The oil uh, is a picture of the Holy Spirit all throughout Scripture. Uh, oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, if you go into the Old Testament, uh, what was the sign of God's authority on a king? They were anointed with oil. That was a picture of the Holy Spirit being upon their lives and them having the influence and the authority of God on their life. Uh, and for us, we are anointed with the Holy Spirit, not on our heads, but within our hearts, meaning we have the authority of Jesus Christ with us. Uh, the scene is the tribulation, midnight, the bridegroom, Christ. Uh, and the bride is who? It's us. Right? A lot of people get into confusion when they deal with kingdom of heaven and there are guests at a marriage. And a lot of people try to teach that, well, you know, we go into the highways and the hedges and we compel them to come into the marriage. That is not us. We are the bride. We're the ones getting married, amen? We get to be a part of that wedding ceremony and there will be a time where God deals with those after the rapture. God can deal once again with the Jews and offers them an open door for them to accept. But a time coming for them once more where that door will shut. Virgins go to meet him, not to marry him. We constantly are to give out our oil. That is impossible here. So where we're at now, we have the oil of God. We have the Holy Spirit, and we are to be constantly giving that uh, away now. After the church is raptured out, the Holy Spirit no longer indwells people. It will come upon them much like the Old Testament, but not in dwelling like the New Testament. And it's interesting, the phrase that is used, he tells them to go to them that sell and buy it for yourself. This is a picture of false religious systems of the Antichrist. Go to them that sell. There is no one that sells the Holy Spirit in the tribulation. What they're saying is, hey, you were foolish. Go to the people that you have accepted. Go to the ones that you have brought in. Go to them and buy for yourself. And of course, they cannot because it's a false system. And so the wise and the foolish, the focus of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, which also deals with coming tribulation. We watch out for the strange woman, the great whore of Revelation 17. Um, I'm going to skip those verses, but you can look that up for yourself. But in Matthew 25.10, again, the door will be shut. There is always only one correct door. I'm going to read one more passage. It's kind of lengthy, but I'm really trying to drive home this fact, and I think it's also pairing well with what we've talked about in Sunday mornings the past couple weeks, because we need to understand this picture of the door, because God uses it several times throughout Scripture. It's not just here in the, in the ark of Noah. Right? I'm trying to show this is not just me trying to take something that was mentioned in Genesis and form a whole message behind it. God is very clear throughout Scripture that when he presents a way, there is one door to it. John chapter number 10, verses 1 through 18. Uh, many of you will know this passage. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, uh, and also that first verse, he that climbeth up some other way, is not in reference to uh, the sheep, right? Mankind is the sheep. God is the shepherd. He that comes in some other way is Satan and his trying to steal away the sheep from God. So understand that when they says some other way, that is not in reference to uh, the door for us. Uh, verse number three, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers." This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Sorry. Jesus, then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. All right, and so this is an interesting passage because God not only is dealing with Israel, he is talking specifically to Jews at this point, but he mentions Gentiles as well. He's talking the whole time about the Jewish flock that he has and the sheep that follow him and know his voice and the fact that he is going to lay down his life for the sheep. No one's going to take that, but he's going to lay it down uh, of his own free will. But he mentions that he has another flock and another fold. That is the Gentile church, the same fold that he will lay his life down for and will offer up himself a sacrifice. And at one point in time, those two folds will become one. After the millennial kingdom, after everything is said and done, and after God has received the glory that is due to him, Jew and Gentile alike will come in and be part of the one fold of God. But no matter which fold you were in, there was one way into it. The Jews had one way to Christ. The Gentiles had one way and one door to Christ. And so going back to this, not dealing with eternal security, but with the nation of Israel in John 16. I mentioned that verse, the other sheep that he has. And so understanding that Jesus is the door. This might seem like a very roundabout way for us to talk about the ark. But this is the first time in the word of God that God mentions a door. That he opens and that he shuts himself. But it's not going to be the last time he talks about it. He's going to continue this picture of a door. And he's going to continue to open doors. Opens the door to heaven. The way through Jesus Christ. He will open doors in our relationships in Colossians. He opens doors of utterance. Not that we open for ourselves, but God opens those, and God shuts those. And so this picture of the flood and the phrase that the Lord shut them in is very applicable to where we are at today. And I feel like after each message, I'm always bringing it down to the same thing, but the lesson of the flood should be a huge motivator for us. Right now, the door of the ark is open. And God wants us to bring everyone in that we can. But listen to me, folks. He's going to shut it. The season of grace will end. And no one can come in, but also no one will go out. And I think we all like to rejoice in the fact that we're in and we can't lose our salvation, that eternal security is a wonderful fact that we can praise the Lord and rejoice in. But I think not enough of us understand the gravity of that no one can go out. Because when that judgment comes, it is not going to be a pleasant time for anybody. It won't be a pleasant time for those being judged, but you can mark it down that that will not be a pleasant experience for us either seeing souls that are cast into the lake of fire. People that we probably know, people that we may have interacted with, they will have interacted with us, co-workers, friends, family members. And there is coming a time when God shuts that door, we will no longer be able to go out and try to bring them in. That door is going to be shut forever. And so what we need to learn is that we need to take advantage of the season of grace that God's given us. 
the more that we talk about these things and going through the churches of, the, of Revelation and seeing the, the history and the timeline that God is laying out, it does seem pretty obvious that his coming is close. And not just in the way that preachers have been preaching for hundreds of years. We read the verse in the Bible, Behold, I come quickly. And you say, oh, well, people have been saying that for hundreds and thousands of years. It's starting to lose its, its gravity, its weight. Of course, behold, he comes quickly is relative to God. But I believe that we are in the last days. Everything that God has said is going to predate the coming judgment is happening or has happened. As it was in the days of Noah, sure does seem like it's becoming like that now. And what are we doing? We have very limited time until the door is open. Temple Baptist Church, let's do everything that we can to bring someone into the ark with us before God shuts that door and we lose the opportunity. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. The invitation, very simple. Are you doing enough? Are you doing everything in your power, everything that you can, to bring someone into the ark with you? Or, are you happy just coming to church, hearing a message, saying amen, raising our Bibles up in the air when pastor tells us to, and rejoice in our salvation? What about all the people that are lost and are on their way to hell and are going to experience the supernatural judgment of God on their life. And we care so little. We can't even go out of our own way to talk to someone about God. As we stand to our feet, heads bowed, eyes closed, this altar's open. Maybe some of us need to just come down and talk with God and rearrange our priorities. Make a commitment that, hey, I haven't been doing anything, but I need to start doing something for God because I want to bring someone on that ark with me. That door is not going to be open forever. And once he shuts it, there's no more opening it. It will be too late for them and for us. The song that's being played is I Wish I Had Given Him More. What a sad thing to have to stand before God with that mentality that you didn't do enough. Dearly Father, Lord, thank you for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for your word, for the story of Noah and the ark. Lord, the lessons that we can learn from it, the different types, the different pictures, that, the ways that Christ is pictured and the typologies throughout Scripture that you use that line up with this story. Lord, I pray that we would take it to heart. Lord, there's a, there's a door that's open right now, but it won't be for long. You've given us a season of grace to do your work. Lord, I pray that we would take advantage of it. Lord, so that we do not have to stand before you thinking, I wish I had given you more. Lord, I want to pray for this church. Lord, that we come together and commit to do something for you. Lord, not just enjoy our salvation, but 
actually do the work that you've intended us to do. And Lord, I pray that we would bring you honor, we would bring you glory through our actions and through our words. Help us to do everything that we can to serve you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We'll be probably one more week in Genesis chapter number 7, and then we'll get into Genesis 8, into the floodwaters receding. Uh, and so uh, be in your place next Sunday night. I'm not going to tell you if I'll be long or short. I told Amber, I said, I did that last week to really test people. Right? You tell them you're going to go longer next week and no one shows up. But the people that do, that's how you know they're with you. <laughs> But, so I'm not going to tell you if I'm going to be long or short next week. You'll have to come and find out for yourself. Uh, but thank you so much for being here uh, and being in the Lord's house. Uh, smile with those about you. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.